we are going uh, to Britain, to the United Kingdom, to our friend, the coast man, Neil Oliver, who joins us. I'm presuming you're back home in Stirling after your holiday, Neil. Uh, yes, well, good morning. Well, it's good morning for me, Sean. I think good, yeah. good evening. Uh, yes, my family and I, my, my wife and my three kids, we were down in Cornwall, uh, down in the southwest of England, uh, and uh, in St Ives in particular, and it was just lovely. Lovely weather, lovely food, uh, and the scenery, well, world class, I would say, is as fine as any coastline I've seen anywhere in the world. Yeah. Well, we talked two weeks ago about the weather and the heat wave that was going to burn the UK to a crisp. That didn't happen, mm. but I read in headlines now, it's now the fear of exceptional, the exceptional risk that wildfires could sweep across Britain this weekend. Yes, I've seen the same warnings. In, certainly in the last very short period, we've gone from weather forecasting to uh, a, a real level of uh, doom uh, around, around weather. Uh, the temperatures have been have been good. I would say it's been a fantastic summer. Mm. Temperatures up in the thirties. I think I think for a couple of days, bits of England touched briefly touched the low forties, uh, which is unprecedented. But it's been it's been lovely weather. But yes, there, there is an increasing atmosphere of fear. Uh, the fear seems to be a a, a, a byword for the way the uh, the population of the UK is to be governed at the moment. Fear of pandemics. Fear of war. Uh, fear of this, that and the other and now it's fear of the weather itself uh, we were warned a few weeks ago to expect uh, thousands, tens of thousands of deaths on account of the high temperatures, they didn't happen uh, and yes now uh, if you watch the weather map in uh, British forecasting it's, it's often tinged, tinted a deep red as though the, the, the island itself was, was about to burst spontaneously into flames <laughs> uh, and yes uh, I dare say, I mean when there's, when there's prolonged dry periods goodness me I don't need to tell you this in, uh, mm. in New Zealand but where the, where the ground gets dry you know where there's a, a, a tinder element builds up in the, in the undergrowth uh, you know, where people throw aside a, you know, a, a cigarette casually, with, you know, without extinguishing, or where, uh, you know, people, you know, it's always been the case that people have set fires uh, in, you know, in dry uh, periods. I dare say there could be fires because there always, there always are. Uh, when we get a prolonged period of hot weather, you know, you get, you get yeah. uh, wildfires breaking out. But yeah, we're, we're being invited to be terrified of the prospect, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, one fire that has never quite been extinguished is the burning desire from some for Scottish independence. And I see that the mm. possibility of a referendum has again been raised by Ms Sturgeon. What's going on here? Y yes, uh, well... I suppose the, the, the background reality there is that for the Scottish National Party, uh, which is, is controlling government in Scotland at the moment, uh, in, in terms of the devolved administration uh, in Edinburgh, the, the raison d'etre, their, their, their existence is predicated upon seeking independence for Scotland. They can't not do that. So they, they can't drop the subject, no matter how much... Uh, information they get from the other side suggesting that the majority of Scots don't want it, which is and always has been the case. You know, going back to the referendum in 2014, uh, that was that was decided by a vote of 55% of, uh, of those voting that they would remain part of the United Kingdom, thanks very much. That sounds closer in some respects than it perhaps was. Of 32 local authorities in Scotland, 28 also voted by a majority uh, to remain part of the United Kingdom. There has never been a majority of Scots wanting independence, uh, but that, that's not enough to discourage the, the Scottish National Party. And so inevitably, because they're on a, a hamster wheel they, that they can't get off, uh, periodically Nicola Sturgeon, the present First Minister and leader of the SNP, uh, has to insist that she's going to seek another referendum uh, to try and secure... Uh, the, the independence that the Scottish National Party wants. They're very effective communicators, SNP. They're, they're very good at getting hold of the microphone and, and broadcasting and giving the impression in Scotland, in the wider UK and, and perhaps in other parts of the world that they speak for a majority of Scots, which they don't and never have and I don't think they ever will. And it's unfortunate for the majority of Scots who, who want to remain part of the United Kingdom 
uh, that we have to stand by while this notion is broadcast that most Scots want independence, which they don't. Uh, the, the opinion polls and the, and the surveys uh, have always made plain that most Scots want to remain part of the United Kingdom. But we have to, like everyone else, we have to stand by while the SNP blares out from its loudspeakers uh, one demand after another for an independence referendum. Uh, at the moment, the noise coming from, from Westminster, from, from the UK government, is that they won't entertain uh, talk of another referendum on independence, that, that that matter was settled in 2014 and that there's no, uh, there's no constitutional need to revisit it at this time. But it, the, the, the fact of the matter is the SNP, by its very nature, for, for its continued existence and to appease its hardline supporters has to be seen perpetually calling for a referendum on independence. Right, it's a drum they have to beat. Is there any, to your mind, rationale, any uh, compelling, no matter how slightly, argument that suggests there would be any sort of advantage for the people of Scotland to be independent? Well... I can only really answer that from a personal perspective. Yeah, I, I will never speak as a as the representative of a constituency of one, which is me. Uh, I don't see any material, economic, or, or societal advantage. Absolutely not. I've I've always been. I, I, I was born and raised. I was born in the sixties, raised in the seventies, and at that time, I, I, I was. I've, I've always. I always, for the longest time, just saw myself as British. I'm Scottish born, but I, my identity is that of a, a citizen of the of Britain, and I, I I love being connected to that to that that larger uh, constituency. You know, I, I love England, Wales, Northern Ireland. I, I like being part of something bigger. Uh, and if if uh, if we were to be broken away into just Scotland, I, I would I would see that as a an unwanted amputation. You know, they say that you know. Uh, Old men, years after losing a limb, still scratch at the at the, at the absent phantom limb. That's how I would feel personally about the about being separated it, it, politically and economically from the from the wider British Isles. Yeah. Uh, so that's really the only honest answer I can give. I completely understand. Obviously, other people, uh, some other people, ardently want to have an independent Scotland. I understand that completely because I'm open to other people's points of view. I just don't share that point of view. And in answer to your question, no, I think Scotland would simply be smaller, poorer. Uh, we wouldn't have the, the simple access that we have had to our biggest market, which is, well, the rest of the UK. Uh, there would be a, the potential of a hard border between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, no, I, I don't see any advantage in it whatsoever. As uh, when it comes to the points of view of other people, I, I cannot speak for them. Also, in a in a Britain that has exited the European Union, it would seem to me you would not want to get any smaller. Well, quite. You know, there's a whole other separate uh, debate ongoing there. The, the the referendum in 2016 about uh, about the European Union and the 52 to 48 majority that chose to have uh, the UK exit the European Union Brexit, as it was known, of course. But that that smouldering uh, fire has never gone out either. And there are still those who lament uh, to this day the, the, the breakaway from the European Union. Um, it's a whole it's a whole separate argument. But, but yes, you you could you could certainly say. Uh, that uh, the, the Scottish National Party would have you believe that an independent Scotland would, would, would immediately seek to rejoin the European Union in its own right. Uh, but it, it's, it's hard to be certain that, that that would be an easy process at all. Uh, Scotland, an independent Scotland, would inherit a large part of the, the UK debt. Uh, uh, it would, in many ways, for many reasons, you know, too long-winded to go into, I suppose, in the case, in the course of this conversation, it, it would be a complicated and protracted, and, and, and potentially, in the long term, unsuccessful process to rejoin the European Union. It's anybody's guess, really. Uh, and but there is there is that argument that uh, that, that Scotland, being a, a fully paid up member of the of the United Kingdom, is is part of a 
a, a larger marketplace for the for the free movement of people and goods and all the rest of it. And uh, and by and by being smaller, by becoming independent, it, it might just in, intensify problems for uh, for for Scottish businesses and the rest. But I, I get. I mean, we live in a we live in a simmering. <laughs> A simmering hotbed of of, uh, of split opinions about whether to be part of the United Kingdom or part of the European Union. It's 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 hot water here, Sean. Yeah, look, I want to talk about another issue I've been following because we are having the, if you like, transgender debate in New Zealand, and it is a particularly bitter and nasty debate, um, oh. and in particular in places like Twitter, but. I've always looked at Britain on this issue, and it is a kind of culture war issue, as being maybe a decade ahead of New Zealand. And I note with interest the closure of the most controversial um, and best known, I think, transgender clinic in, in Britain, the Tavistock Transgender Clinic. Why has it been closed? And what are the stories coming out about the way it was operated? Well, I think in 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 simple terms, in short, I think when the Tavistock was was looked at from within the, the NHS, the National Health Service, there was a there was a conclusion drawn by by those who looked at the clinic that um, the the best interests and the safety of children was was not necessarily being best taken care of. Uh, within the Tavistock clinic and a, a decision was made simply to close it down and that, as you say it's the, it's the only what do they call it a reassignment a gender reassignment of the services that were amongst those services it wasn't the only thing that Tavistock dealt with but it was the only place in uh, in, in Britain that, that, that people could go to for that particular to have that conversation let's say uh, I think that there was a, a, a feeling that uh, Children, you know, people under the age of consent in, in any sense were being maybe fast-tracked uh, onto medications and, and towards surgeries, uh, both of which, you know, the, 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 the medications and certainly surgery, you know, cause irreparable transformations that can't be, that can't be gone back on. Uh, and I think there was simply a, a, a decision taken within the wider National Health Service that that was no longer the right way to to proceed. Uh, you, you know, you're saying it, it's 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 bitter and and uh, very hot tempered in New Zealand. Well, it, it's certainly I think it's that way everywhere. I think certainly Britain uh, and certainly everywhere else in the West, there's a, there's terribly hot tempered discussions around the notion of of trans. Uh, I, I I simply lament the, the the loss of of understanding of of basic biology. Uh, I, I still say that a, a man is a man and a woman is a woman. I don't I don't accept that you can change sex. I, I think that's scientifically biologically impossible. I do understand that that there are people. I think a relatively small percentage of people who who feel that they're uh, in the wrong body or they're in the wrong gender and and like everyone else i, I feel your people in, in those circumstances must be treated with absolute respect and dignity um but i think uh, the notion that you can change someone's sex with drugs and surgery is uh, is misplaced also there is the question of legal liability i know some cases i think emerging in britain of people who have, with the blessing of their parents and the encouragement of those who would be self-styled counsellors, who are now saying, you allowed me to do things to my body and damage my body in ways uh, which you shouldn't have. You should have stood, in, stood against my desire yes. to, to change my sex. Well, yes, that's, uh, you, know, you know, the 2020 vision of hindsight there, uh, uh, there were always voices saying that if people, if anyone takes certain steps, you know, you cross the Rubicon there with with surgery and with and with some of the medication. There are things, steps taken that can't be untaken, uh, and I, I think it was always inevitable that uh, once once we got to a position, let's see where we are now, to have a stop being closed, uh, you know, perhaps the 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 debate being reworked and other things, other points of view being aired now. I think it's inevitable that people will come forward who in in the past 
uh, at a young age, maybe under the age of consent or whatever, have, have undertaken procedures and will now be seeking compensation, legal recourse, you know, to say this, this shouldn't have happened to me. I think that's inevitable. Uh, and we, we could, I suppose, yes, uh, quite, it's, it's easy to imagine a situation where many people will come forward saying, I, am, I have now arrived in a position, in a place that I, I don't want to be in. If I had my time again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the things that I did or, or undertake the procedures that I did. And, and now I want, to be, I, I want restitution and compensation. I'm, mm. I'm sure there will be a slew of people coming forward saying, uh, I, I was given bad advice and, and I feel wronged. Mm. Neil, do you think with the closure of Tavistock, with those cases emerging, and with international sports bodies, it seems to me finally standing up against what would say what some would say is the emperor has no clothesism of transgender competition in athletics and swimming and other things, and rugby, I think, is uh, the latest to ban transgenders from um, physical contact rugby over the age of twelve. Uh -huh. Do you think on this mm. in this particular battlefield in the culture wars, some sanity, some reason is returning to the debate? It does look that way. Uh, I, I I certainly would welcome it. I think there is a sense of a, a change in the in the wind direction. Let's say, I think there's a there's a feeling of a of a, a shift uh, towards what I would regard as common sense. Uh, like many people, I looked on at the idea of people who'd been, who were, who were men, uh, then identifying as uh, women, although in, in lots of cases, uh, still completely physically intact males taking part in high level uh, sport against women, I thought was just wrong. Uh, and I, I know a lot of people shared that point of view. And yes, I think that there's possibly just a return to a, a straightforward common sense approach that Women, I mean, we've all watched, uh, I mean, generations of, of women seeking to, you know, raise the profile of women's sport and, the, you know, and, 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 you know, working, dedicating their whole lives to, to reaching the highest levels of performance of which they are capable, uh, only to find themselves at the last minute, as it were, in, in whatever cycling or swimming or, or, or all sorts of contact sports, contemplating facing men uh, in their in their, in their sports, which is just not fair. Um, and I think perhaps fairness, basic fairness and common sense has, uh, has found its feet again. Uh, and I would, uh, I'm, I'm completely supportive of that. Yeah. Hey, talking of sport, of course, the Commonwealth Games have just wrapped up in Birmingham. Now, because New Zealand had its biggest ever medal hall and we're a slightly sports nutty country here, uh, we'd watch two cats <laughs> fight in a phone booth um, uh, if it was a sport or be good, could be described as a sport. Can I ask you, have, um, has Britain paid much attention to the Commonwealth Games or do you, or is it just like some second-tier competition? Oh, no. No, I, I, have to, I should probably hold my hand up at this point and say I am not interested in sport. Don't, don't hate me for this. I no, can, I don't. I, don't. I, I mean, it's... At school, at school, you know, I was always in that that those uh, that outlier tiny community that didn't want to play football. And you got picked last Soccer for the didn't, team didn't, in the playground, didn't, didn't you, oh, Neil? Ab absolutely, absolutely, uh, Sean. I just did not have that. Incl I didn't didn't like sport, and as an adult, I've never watched it. I don't watch. I don't support any teams <clears throat> and whatever. Yeah. So you're you're classically talking to the wrong guy here, but I can testify and say that there's massive support and there has been huge enthusiastic support for the Commonwealth Games here in Britain. Absolutely. I mean, I'm surrounded by people. I'm in this, I'm in this unlikely minority. Uh, I, I listen to their excitement and, <laughs> and their passion with a degree of, uh, you know, with a degree of amazement and, 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 and lack of understanding. But no, in answer to your question, the Commonwealth Games, you know, this time in Birmingham, uh, are, are watched with, you know, every every ounce of the enthusiasm that you're describing for your, for yeah. your fellow New Zealanders. Well, I can tell you what, sport-wise, this, <clears throat> this, this country, New Zealand, is having a nervous breakdown because we lost to the Irish in rugby at home for the first time ever. And I can only imagine the fallout oh, from that. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Honestly, there's people thrashing them, dressing in sackcloth and uh, you know, whipping themselves in the streets. Then we went to South Africa yeah. last weekend and we got owned by the South Africans. There is a game this weekend 
And if we lose this one, there is a... I imagine there's a slight possibility the coach of the All Blacks won't just be fired. He will be hung, drawn and quartered in the main street of Wellington when he returns to New Zealand. So <laughs> I can tell you we, yes. we've got issues with sport here right now. Yes. Well, I, I, yeah, I've spent enough time in, in New Zealand and obviously, I mean, you know, the, you know, the All Blacks and the, the legend that is and, and all of... And, and I know about New Zealanders commitment to uh, to, to sport, you know, we, you know, you know, I'm, I'm connected to you all via uh, Leanne, yeah. Malcolm, and and uh, and, uh, and Phil Smith, uh, and I know that their their boy <laughs> is so it was such a passionate golfer and I think cricketer as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it Phil's Phil's passion for the for those sports was, you know, I, I got it. You know, it's like standing next to, to something and catching it by osmosis. Um, yep. just, I, I couldn't be around. <laughs> but I tell you, it's tough a, being a in New Zealand right now. Enthusiasm. It is very, very only, tough. I can only imagine. Yeah. I wouldn't, I mean, I, I understand it enough, although I don't get it. I absolutely understand commitment and passion to sport, either as a competitor or a, a spectator or both. And I would not seek to, I don't seek to mock. Absolutely not. I, I get it. I understand the passion and I respect it. And, I, my, I I I I um I I go down on my, <laughs> I, I I doff my metaphorical cap and say mm. I, you only have my sympathies. I get it. Mm. Look, another discussion we've been having on my show with many of our callers and listeners, and I'm really interested to see if, if the same phenomenon plays out in the UK, and that is an obsession by people who do not live or vote in America with what is happening in American politics and news, particularly with Donald Trump, particularly with a guy like Alan Jones. I have listeners, followers, people on social media who just follow every, every twist and turn of these incredibly mm. partisan political show trials and FBI raids and, the other th and other things. Are there people in Britain who are equally obsessed with what's happening in a country they do not live in or vote in? Yes, uh, definitely. I think I think we're we're all. I think perhaps we have we in the in Britain. I I certainly would say that I grew up um, accepting or, or being aware of of America, the United States of America, as as being a kind of uh, a, a younger brother, perhaps. Let's say in terms, uh, you know, constitutionally or historically speaking, you know, much younger than Britain, but. Younger brother, but but a much larger younger brother, very very powerful, uh, and any move that the USA might make uh, uh, domestically or internationally would inevitably have consequences for us uh, because the the reach was is was so great, and so you grow up, I suppose, absorbing a a, a necessary awareness of what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic. But in more recent years, I think we're all aware of, of the extent to which political debate has become terrifyingly uh, uh, polarised. Uh, it, it's it's become increasingly difficult to talk about things political without it becoming a hate fest either way. If, if you say anything, the people who oppose your point of view, rather than just wanting to talk about it or debate it, uh, they want to cast the opposition. They need to be vilified. They need to be exorcised. They need to be. They, yeah. they need to be thrown out into outer darkness. Uh, which is uh, for for someone like myself. I mean, I I, I love debate, and I, I love being in a in, in mixed company where I can be with people who've got some of them have, have my opinion or a version of it, and other people are are, are diametrically opposed. And I, I've always loved having those kind of. Uh, debates on the understanding that when the debate came to a close, you know, you would you would go your separate ways and come back a week later and do it all again mm. with no hard feelings. But that's become increasingly difficult, and I, I think that atmosphere has, for those of us who are interested, has uh, almost inevitably intensified people's mm. interest. But rather than it being just a talking point now, it's become about blood and bone it's become about you know right to life it, it's you know it's existential now mm. or it's been made to Look, feel that I, way I think it's fascinating. Any debate. yeah i think it's fascinating that you see the same trend in britain and neil i'll be honest it oh, really I worries me I, I it really worries me and i sit here 
as someone involved in media in my small corner of the world, I would like to think I've got some a teaspoonful of influence. And I really think it is time for people who are concerned about it to start thinking about how we can correct this horribly divisive and, and what could be an mm-hmm. ultimately in terms of democracy and freedom of speech, a really destructive debate. Can you imagine a way in which we can moderate this obsession so that it doesn't damage us? It's very difficult, Sean. I think what we're living through now is, well, let's say, for the, for the sake of it, let's say the end game of what has been a very long and subtle and almost invisible process. I think that there are many factors to do with education, uh, you know, not, not the least of them. I think that there has been a long process uh, by which our uh, engagement with debate has been steadily, progressively debased. Yeah. Uh, and maybe in, sim- in simple terms, a- a- an understanding or an acceptance that, let's say, geopolitics, but, but almost any matter you can think of, mm. is almost always more complicated than you can even imagine. And, and for that reason, when it comes to talking about it in mixed company, the debate of necessity ought to be nuanced and making mm. allowances for other points of view, those that you're aware of and also those that you can just instinctively sense will be there whether they're being voiced or not. And that kind of awareness necessarily tempers what you say mm. and the responses that you make to other points of view. But the whole thing has been... I think, in, to, uh, to, to simplify, it, it's been, uh, our, uh, we've been invited to think that everything is simple, yeah. that every matter is black and white, right, right and wrong, yeah. and that you ought to be able to see the right way, the good mm. way, and that if you don't put yourself in that camp, then you're automatically to be vilified, ridiculed, and, and cast out of society. But as you and well, I... that's what cancel you know, culture is, isn't it? Yeah, we, we know that matters are, everything's complicated. Relationships between one another as, as human beings are complicated. National politics are complicated. You know, the war in Ukraine, for example, complicated. Scottish independence that we've just been discussing, complicated. And because of that, any debate ought to be nuanced and respectful mm. because the, what you seem to learn as you get older is there are no, there are no hard and fast rights and wrongs. Everything is shades of grey yeah. rather than black and white. And I, I love if, the if, way if, Stephen we, Fry, we, we put us, it, and I'll paraphrase him, he said, you know, he's just so frustrated that everybody is so obsessed with being right all the time. People do not understand or accept that they can be wrong and they can have their mind changed or they can alter their views of the world. Yeah, as well as right and wrong, there are simply alternative, there are many points of view on any given subject, small or large, Mm. uh, with 8 billion people on the planet, there's the possibility of 8 8 billion or 7.5 billion different points of view. And to try and corral everyone into one of two camps it's on crazy. the basis of every subject is crazy. Yeah. Look, there's a story in GB News I just wanted to mention and get your views on too. Um, UK universities have placed trigger warnings on more than a thousand books, texts they cause them, uh, I call them, amid fears mm. the content is challenging. Apparently these warnings have been placed on books written by authors such as William Shakespeare and Charles Dickens. I didn't know they were such trigger merchants. This is craziness. I, I don't know. Um, I almost don't know where to begin uh, in responding to this. This is, not the, this is not the beginning of a situation. This is just an, an ongoing process. Uh, we're being continually uh, nudged uh, to think that there are books and topics and points of view that are wrong bad, not even to be entertained. Uh, This is just another step in that direction. Universities in Britain, certainly in the United States, are in a parlous condition, I would say. Uh, They've been uh, they've been captured by, by ideologies, they've been captured by political indoctrination. Uh, schools are, are little better. I think 
students go to school now and students go to university not to be educated but to be indoctrinated whether they want to be or not they're not being taught how to think they're being told what to think university i went to university uh, and it ought to be a time when when younger minds are confronted with all sorts of ideas that challenge them uh, maybe anger them uh, but certainly give them food for thought Uh, And the idea that we're nudging back towards the territory of book burning, which this is in all but name, uh, should terrify us all. Uh, The the works of of geniuses from the past, you know, you mentioned Shakespeare, you mentioned Dickens, but that that list is long uh, and enlightening. And people ought to be able to go to university in the expectation that they will see things, hear things, read things, and have conversations about subjects that frighten them, unsettle them, make them see the world in all manner of different ways. Uh, And and anything that dilutes that experience is a backward step. Hear, hear. Neil, we're out of time. It's always a great pleasure uh, talking to you. We will do this again in a fortnight. Uh, Take care and fight the madness and don't burn up. In the heat wave. Yeah, love, love to you, love to you and yours, Sean. Here's to Aotearoa. Take it easy. Uh, that is uh, our UK correspondent uh, Neil Oliver checking in from Stirling. Um, and isn't it interesting the mad obsession of left and right and polarised politics and, and looking at America isn't just happening here in New Zealand, as Neil said, a global phenomenon.